<laughs> we're here, we're live. Michael Verney, a thousand push ups in an hour. You're almost ready to go. Um, first off, let's talk about why we're doing this a thousand push ups in an hour. What was it that made you decide I need to do this? Oh, I suppose it just looking, everybody's during the whole COVID thing, it's a bit of a, of a crisis, obviously. People are stuck in their houses and not in great form. But, you know, when you see people coming together for Do It For Dan, and you see people raising funds for PPE, I was just like, just what can I do? Is there anything I can do? Unfortunately, my legs are goose now at this stage, so I can't do much running. I can't go do marathons or anything like that. But my shoulders are still in decent shape at the moment. So I saw Ray Milet try the, the 1,000 push-ups challenge, challenge. Now, he's a professional boxer, obviously. I'm anything but professional. Maybe a professional journalist, but that's about it. So I said, maybe I could give that a go. I was always decent at the push-ups. So I said I'd give that a go. Oh, it was only 10 days ago. I did a good bit of training. I have a nice few push-ups under my belt. Now, whether I'm able to get to 1,000 or not, I suppose people will have to tune in over the next hour to see. Yeah, because it was only last night I said... Right, he's thinking about doing 17 a minute. I'll have a go at that myself. And after four minutes, I was more or less done. I was ready to pack it in. So I don't know how you're going to do that for 60. But uh, can you just quickly, a word about uh, who you're doing it, uh, who you're raising the funds for? Yeah, obviously, you can't have enough um, personal protective equipment for all the doctors and nurses and everybody on the front line. So that's one part of it. And obviously, do it for Dan. We've all seen the unbelievable work that's gone on over the past six weeks. Two million rays to send uh, Dan Donner over to America for a life-changing surgery, life-changing infusion. Uh, that's, they're, my two, they're my two causes. I just encourage everyone to donate um, two unbelievably worthy causes. And uh, by the end of tonight, I'd hope to be, hopefully we can be up around, my goal was 12 grand. Maybe we can get up around 15 grand by the end of tonight with a bit of luck. If people, I'd love to see if, if I do do the thousand, maybe people will be even more generous. So that's something that's on my shoulders, a bit of pressure on my shoulders. Yeah, absolutely. Let's everyone get behind Michael Verney as he gives it a go here. So we're going to get you to assume the position and we'll start the, the countdown clock. Um, it's going to be tough. You're a fair man for trying it, I have to say. So we'll give you the, the countdown starting in. Are you ready to go? Ready to Yourself go, yeah. and your Monopoly dog. We'll go in three, two, one, go. Not bad form there so far. So we've a big show coming up over the next hour or so. We're going to have uh, Pat Spillane on first, the Kerry legend. Then we're, uh, we're having uh, Eamon Dunphy, who's a fantastic guest to have, and Davy Fitzgerald. We might get to talk to someone else along the line. We'll, uh, we'll have to see how things pan out. This is live and God knows what's going to happen. Michael, how did that first set go? Yeah, Shane, the plan is to do 17 a minute. So if you do 17 for 59 minutes, I get to a thousand, so that's the plan. Um, going, all, going okay so far, yeah. But the first two sets are bound to be okay. And every so often I'll update the amount of push-ups done on the screen there. He has 17 done, but uh, we'll get to that in a little while. Now, our first guest, uh, Pat Spillane. Pat, delighted to have you on. Um, how, how's life with you at the moment? Are you well? You're probably delighted to see an awfully man getting a bit of misery. Well, first of all, can, can, can we not see him in action at all? I wish you were. Who's, who's to convince us that he's going to do it? <laughs> well, don't worry. I'm keeping an eye on him here. And like, is there, do you know, like the lotto, is there somebody from Stokes, Kennedy, Crowley, or some, some accountant of repute to, to count? No? <laughs> well, maybe you'll keep tally on him. Keep... <laughs> Jesus. Come here, would you tell me this? What computer threw up Dunphy, Davy Fitz, and Pat Spillane on the one podcast? Jesus. Well, we can we... flick three, three of those fellas on the nation for a shot. Yeah, right? you often say that that two lads, they might be two cheeks at a one arse. We might have found three cheeks on the one arse. Three, absolutely, wrecked. absolutely. <laughs> so look, it's great. To, look, I'm delighted to be on. I mean, the one thing that this lockdown and this COVID crisis is, is that it has shown what Irish people are like. The, you know, going back to the old days in the country areas, we had the mehel where neighbours helped neighbours out. And we're seeing that mehel again in existence in this country where people are just helping one another out, doing brilliant gestures like Michael is doing here to raise money. And the people of the country being so good in, in dipping their hands into their pocket to contribute to really good causes. So congratulations, Michael. Congratulations to everyone in this country who've shown that we are a nation that when it comes to it, we can, we can, we can do it. We can give. Absolutely. And maybe more on the fun side of things, uh, Offaly are a county, Michael's ca county, oh, Jesus. they've obviously uh, dished out the misery to you in the past. Now, you did get a bit of uh, a bit of payback last year. You relegated them to the Christie Ring in Hurling. But, uh, <laughs> 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 Jesus, no, that's, 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 that's clutching and straws up here. Uh, look, any, any, look, Offaly inflicted pain on the Christie Ring last year. 
And yes, it was a push in the back, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, but so any any opportunity I can get to see an awfully person or to hear of an awfully person in pain, well, then that gives me a little bit of pleasure. But you know, it's gas. That's one of the things, the annoying things about this lockdown is that Jesus, it's a rerun of all old games. And I don't know what, it, but all the classic games, all the great matches that every TV station seems to be finding are all matches which Kerry lost. And geez, we never won a classic in the years, but any uh, and. For about 20 years, Shane, Jesus, I never looked at the 1982. For 30 years, I suppose, I never looked at it. Maybe for 35 years, I never looked at it. Because I'd say it would be the equivalent of trying to get a look at your own funerals. And all. So I never... But but in the last year or two, I'm starting to get the courage. I've never seen it all, but I'm dipping in and out. And the first thing I dipped in, to, I wanted to find out, Jesus, was it really a push in the back or not? Or was it really? And I slowed it down and I did it. And I wore my Sunday game and this hat and, and I said, ah, yeah, it was, yeah. But, but I tell you, what I was really intrigued about, I swear to God, I, little flashbacks every now and again from that game that you say, I wonder was this correct or not? And I always remember the referee pulling me up for touching the ball on the ground. And I said, oh, Jesus, I think that was a real harsh card. And the other night, fuck it, I said, I'm going to watch it and I'm going to honestly say what this about it. I can picture the scene, second half, the ball goes loose on the on the ground. I'm about to come in, I'm about to pick it up, and Johnny Guinan, the offlay player, catches me by the ankle, knocks me over, I fall on the ball. Jesus did not what the referee did. He gave a free <laughs> he gave a free to second offlay for me handling the ball on the ground. Ah oh, Jesus. Anyway, we've got to let go. We've got to let go. We've got to let go. Yeah, but maybe it's because you won so much. We sort of marvel at the yeah. tiny bit of misery that you have. Absolutely. Do you know? Look, no. Do we begrudge Offaly and Alan? Not bit more. Absolutely not. Score lines never lie. Uh, we just. Do you know? We talked a lot about the five in a row last year uh, because Dublin obviously achieved it. We didn't do it. The, there was two differences between the Dubs and the Kerry team. With the Kerry team, I was involved in. It was pretty much the same fellas. Uh, the only reason we didn't have the same team for the five row as for the first match was Jimmy Deenan and myself were injured. Other than that, if we hadn't been injured, we'd have had the same team pretty much for the five years. That was number one. The second thing was that in the drawing game, Kerry went into the lead with 12 minutes to go. So Dublin had 12 plus injury time, which was six or seven or eight. They had another 18 or 19 minutes to, to settle in, get back into the game get that composure back and get that equalising point. When Seamus Darby got the goal, it was in the closing stages and we really, it was catch up. But look, and I say this about Offaly, I don't begrudge them their victory. Those players that played that time uh, were legends of the game. And I talk about one Offaly player in particular, Matt Connor. Ah, most gifted forward. And just, uh, it's just, I hope someday somebody will, will pick out the clips, and particularly the All-Ireland semi-final display he gave against Kerry in 1981. Uh, one of the greatest individual displays ever given by a player in championship in Cork. He, he was a genius. poetry in motion. Like if you saw him in a uh, Kerry jersey, like he'd, he'd fitted quite well. He was a genius. He was just a genius. Uh, great balance, left and right, very accurate, very composed. He was just, he was just a genius. I mean, the, the he was just, uh, you know, so you, 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 you hate to see a county like Offaly, you know, hurling team struggling, football team starting a little bit under John Mohan. But, you know, like what they achieved in those days with the hurlers and the footballers for a small county was absolutely amazing. Will it be done again by a small county? Probably never. Mm. I actually did a, piece, um, an, a video with Liam Hayes, who, of course, um, won a couple of All-Irelands with me in the 80s recently. And he was talking about this current Kerry team and also Mayo, and he said that Mayo have the leaders, but they don't have the geniuses, whereas Kerry have the geniuses, but they don't have the leaders to get over the line, whereas Dublin have both. That's a fair point, but at the end of the day, you know, at the end of the day, you look to all the All-Ireland winning teams, football or even hurling, and what you need to get over the line, you need at least two, perhaps three, marquee forwards. Two forwards, three forwards, What's a marquee forward? And a forward that's on his day unmarkable of a contributor. Do Mayo have a marquee forward? No, they don't. Do Kerry have marquee forwards? Probably two, probably three. Dublin have three or four. But you're right, leadership is the thing. Actually, can I just, do you know when I was asked to command this last night by Michael Vermey and fair play to him, and he talked about push ups. And, and do you know what? I got flashbacks. 1979, Irish superstars and world superstars. 
because uh, I don't know if there's any uh, of the listeners or the viewers here remember the superstars. Superstars was where you got the top sports stars in Ireland t- competing against each other, cycling, running, swimming. And one of the things was there was a press up and chin up competition. And I swear to God, I mean, I was absolutely, uh, and I was a fit athlete. I trained ferociously hard. I did weight training before weight training was ever done. I bought a weight machine when no one ever had a weight machine. But Jesus, I said, I couldn't do two press-ups, not to hope in the world. I, and the gas part about it, I, I, I terrible weak arms, uh, couldn't catch the ball over my head, couldn't do a press-up. And, and every night for the last six months, I lie awake in bed for hours upon hours with arthritis in both shoulders. Oh my God, I haven't a fucking clue because I didn't use them. I didn't even shoulder a fella because I was ducking them. Do you, I was I was talking about Bomber Liston recently also in our game today and he was talking about that great relationship he had with Miko because he was a teacher posted in Waterville and that Miko used to take him out do extra training with him I suppose helped him to become the player that he that he became how instrumental was Miko in the player you became uh, I'll tell you this do you know what Shane I wrote an article in Sunday World last week and it was an article about some about dreams because I find that I'm dreaming a lot at night and I'm dreaming about football. And the gas part about the dreams in the football is I'm not dreaming about any game I lost. <laughs> I'm not dreaming about any game I had a bad match. I'm dreaming about all the great times and the great victories and the great memories. But while I was writing the article, I said, look, Miko made me into what I was. And I was just, uh, and he made us all into, we might have won two, as a team, we could have won two all Ireland medals probably because we were so good. Uh, would we have ever won eight without Miko? Not a hope we won. But, but I'll give you two very quickly what, what made him so special. There was a couple of things about him. He made you feel like you were 10 foot tall. He made you feel like you were the best left back forward in the world. The best full back. Bomber, the best full forward. That was first thing he made. You, you were 10 foot tall. You were the best. Secondly, fitness. Uh, he could get you. Do you know what? The, it's something that the innate ability that a Willie Mullins has or a Nate O'Brien has that knows when the horse is ready, that knows. Miko had that had an innate ability that could know in like he he you you do you trained hard over the winter. You did the laps of the field, the laps of the field, the rounds of the field, the rounds of the field, the mud. And people would say, Jesus, that's old fashioned, that's out of date. It still works to this day. And do you know why rounds of the field, why they were so good in January, February, and March? Because one, you built up stamina. But more importantly, the fellow who would give you 100% in February or March would be the fellow who would give you 100% in July. So the stamina was built up. That was number two. Number three, he realized at a very early stage, around 1979, that motivation, you know, we had just won two All-Ireland medals. And medals, for a, like, it's easy for a professional sports fellow to remain motivated because the more you win, the more you get paid. Amateur sports person. Uh, the more you win, you get another medal. Uh, and Mika realized that, well, maybe another medal, even if it's an all-out medal and brilliant, but it's accumulation. It's two, it's three, it's four. And Mika introduced, started saying, right, we need to motivate these fellas. We dangled carrots. And the first car, the carrot he dangled was the holidays. So we started with the canaries. We started with the smallest canary. And we moved up to the bigger canaries. And then we got to America. And in 1981, uh, to win four in a row, if we won four in a row, the deal was we had a five-week holiday. And we won five. We won four in a row. And as a as a reward, we had a five-week holiday. Shane, one week, three weeks in Australia, one week in Hawaii, and a week between San Francisco and New York. Not alone that, we had fourteen hundred pounds a man pocket money in nineteen eighty-one. It was just brilliant. It was absolutely brilliant. That was the but the main thing, Shane. The main thing, uh, is and I've said it so many times now. Nico's team talks. We were in 10 all Ireland finals. That's a lot of Munster finals. That's a lot of all Ireland semi-finals. That's a lot of matches. There was two things about Nico's team talks. He never, ever, ever spoke about the opposition in his team talk. And he never, ever, ever spoke about the opposition's star players in his team talk and how we could stop them. It was belief in our own ability, belief in our teammates' ability, and we could deliver. Our glass was always half full. And I'll tell you this, Shane, it was a philo- it was a philosophy we had on the field to play. And it's something that as an individual off the field, I have always carried through life in that my philosophy going through life has always been that of being positive and my glass always being half full. 
Excellent. And that's what Dwyer gave me. He made me the player I was, and I think I would like to think he made me the person, and he gave me the career that I achieved afterwards. Fantastic. What we'll do is we'll touch in. Uh, we'll we'll just touch base with Michael here when he finishes this round of push-ups and see how <laughs> is he's he still getting. alive. He's still alive, Michael. How are you doing? How many? Not too bad. Not too bad. The shoulders are getting tired already, though, unfortunately. So uh, we're going to have to dig deep. We're, we were a sixth of the way there. We should have nearly over two hundred done nearly this stage. Yeah. Two, 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 one, so not, too, not doing too bad. Yeah, I haven't had a chance to actually update the, the push-ups so far, but I will do so in a little while. Uh, we'll come back to you again in a couple of minutes, Michael. Uh, Pat, what I'm wondering is, do you have a big interest in other sports outside of Gaelic football, or is that the be-all and end-all to you? My life is all about sport. I am retired as a teacher at 10 years. As a, I retired as principal. And my day on television, on a bad day, is five or six hours television and on the weekend is 10 or 12 hours television i watch sport morning noon and night i go from racing to boxing to rugby to you name it anything with sport i will watch it i will watch three and, uh, i will watch three and four soccer games two and three rugby games all the racing you name it i love sport and i'm at the moment i'm just, with, with netflix so we're devouring everything i finished the two series of sunderland till i die uh brilliant the English game, which was not so much as much, uh, as much about soccer, as, and I'm loving Michael Jordan because Michael Jordan is oh Jesus, just 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 to get into the psyche of Michael Jordan and what made, made Michael Jordan, you know, the great the great basketballer was. I, I'll tell you this: any aspiring sports person, youngster, should should watch that Michael Jordan, there, Jordan documentary. It's just brilliant. Is it something about the dominance too? Like you were part of the team that was dominant, and then you know Jordan. His, his Chicago Bulls were completely dominant. So do you see something in what they did and what he did and think, I, I like that, or it sort of correlates with, with our well, story? From, from a team point of view with, 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 with the Bulls, say, and with Kerry, there are similarities. Driven, very driven, very different, but very different types of individuals. Do you know, very different types of individuals. And, and, and just that can blend, and a good manager, you know, with, with the Bulls, they had Phil Jackson, we had Mick Underwood that that could allow players, you know, that weren't, there wasn't, you know, I was, I, I'm picking my dream team from next Sunday and the Sunday world. What would be my dream team in Gaelic football? But you know, we had to pick the manager. And to be perfectly honest, it was a struggle to find a manager, a top class Gaelic football manager at the moment, because the, outside of Mickey Happ, no one has an all out and seen him. But I just need to But I said I picked out Jim Gavin. What? What made Jim Gavin a great manager? What made Mickey, Mickey O'Dwyer a great manager? Empowerment. Left the players. Empowered the players. Trust in the players. Believe in the players. And over the last 10 or 15 years, in particularly in Gaelic football, we didn't empower the players. Instead, coaches and managers eh, eh, drove a, a, a game plan and a defensive system. And they were shackled. And they were playing, you know. And now, with Dublin, and even with Kerry slightly now, the sh- and with Galway at the moment, the shackles have come off and players have been empowered more to express themselves, to play with a bit more freedom, play to their strengths. Do you, you know, when ultimately, and it seems a little bit uh, trite to talk about it at the moment, sport coming back when there's you know far more serious things going on with COVID-19, but if there's an opportunity to play uh, closed, behind closed doors games, would you accept that ahead of nothing? You would well, like 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 Stephen O'Brien was interviewed today in one of the papers, maybe in all the papers, uh, and he made a point that intercounty players nowadays are so familiar because they train behind closed doors. They play so many challenge games up and down the country behind closed doors. Uh, at the end of the day, if it's the last, if it's the last, the only op, the only possibility of finishing the championship by playing closed doors, oh, I say go for it, go for it. And you know what? And it's not a selfish reason. I think it just would lift. I, I, we need sport. Sport, like, okay, sport isn't a matter of life and death. And I think we realise that now. But at the same time, sport is our escape valve. Sport is what lifts us out of the, the mundane and the doom and gloom and the problems of life. And I think we, we need sport, whether it, is li- whether it is sport behind closed doors or sport in front of us. But I think we need that escape valve in our life at the moment. And that's what sport can provide. When you think of the teams that you played on over the years, and I spoke with Bomber about this also, that a couple of the players unfortunately have, have passed away, John Egan and, and Horace Kennelly, Paddy, Paddy O'Shea, yeah, of course. Like, when you think about them, what comes to mind? Uh, 
Do you know when you're flying fit and you're the fittest people and you're the fittest team in Ireland, which we were at the time, and you feel, Jesus, you're invincible. I'm so fit. I'm so strong. Ah, you know, nothing can take me. And you know, uh, the deaths of Paddy, Tim Kennelly, and John Egan. Oh, Jesus! It hits us hard. It hits us hard because it suddenly realised, hey, Jesus, we're not invincible. We're not infallible. Whatever like that. So uh, it, 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 it. Like we trained hard, we played hard, we had a great time together, and we missed them. I, I miss Paddy. You know, uh, I miss. I, I spoke about them last week. I miss Kennelly. The horse. He was one of the strongest men I ever came across in the Gaelic football field. Long relieving clearances, held that centre back. Egan, the coolest man in the world. I swear to God, I mean, great ball carrier, beautiful balance, a lovely finisher. You know, he was the coolest man. You'd be inside in the dressing room, five minutes to go to run out the field, all out and fine. You'd be revved up, so that you'd be ready to go. The wire would be pounding the table, and Egan would turn to you and he'd say, where are you going for a pint after? And he said, oh, Jesus, John, which way do we play the Ireland final? And, and Paddy was, Paddy was Paddy. I mean, Jesus. Paddy was the warrior you had. You, you, you know, when you went into battle, you needed likes of Paddy. I mean, if you weren't revved up to the dressing with Paddy around you, because Paddy was there book collecting around, he might be in his own defense, he might be in his own defense, but he'd be shouldering you, he'd be running over here and shouldering somebody else, and he'd have you revved and revved and revved, and he was great. He was just great. So we missed them. We missed them. Do you know what? That's. I think. I, I think we're doing a lot of, because with, we have so much free time at the moment. We are doing a lot of reflecting, and I think. Do you know. I. Th- I think. I think we're going to. We're going to reconfigurate our lives after this, and the way we look at life. Uh, and I look at. I'm 64. 64 years old. 65 this year. So I've been very lucky. I can't complain. And. When you think back in your career, and if you can leave the Offaly 82 out of it for, you know, I mean, cause oh, obviously that, that's obviously the answer. But is there any other games that you wish you could play again? No, none at all. No? Look, uh, no, none at all. I have no regrets. Swear to God, Shane, played in 10 all and seen a football finals. We won eight. No regrets. I, if, you know, I, I, I missed uh, probably the two best years of my footballing career with an anterior two shit ligament. Uh, and people and, and I have arthritis and I probably need a knee replacement and like I said I don't sleep at night with the shoulders and people said do you regret it and if you got a chance to turn the clock back what would you do differently Jesus Shane I wouldn't do anything differently I do the whole lot I had a we had a wonderful wonderful time wonderful life a roller coaster of a ride uh, absolutely no regrets mm. no regrets never had regrets never had regrets we got beaten by Offaly in 82 went into the cubicle in crop in the dressing room. I cried. I cried for five minutes. You actually cried over and that? I, oh. Ah, inside the cubicle. I locked the cubicle and I cried, cried for five minutes. And do you know what? When I came out of the cubicle, that was it. I departed. I departed and I decided, fuck it. I'm going to get my cruciate knee operation, which at the time wasn't being done in Ireland. I said, I found a pill in England. I went to England. And do you know what? We came together again and we won three more all Adams. And if we had won 82, would we have won three more all Adams? No. But we had the motivation then to, you know, you never want to finish. Look, the history of sport, no one gets the last hurrah right. And none of us ever did. But we, we didn't want to finish at 82. One of the years then, um, I'm not sure, was it 83 or 84 maybe, you beat Dublin, but you actually took the gamble of taking a photograph b- b- behind a washing machine and it was in the newspaper the next day. D- did you know it was, was going to be yeah, a big we deal? Did. We, t- we took the team for uh, one year uh, for four in a row. Uh, I think four in a row, three. We took a photograph the morning of the All Ireland in the Grand Hotel in Malahide, so that so that so that we could have photographs of the winning team for sale the following day. <laughs> that was we, that was our that was that was Mikko because Mikko like Mikko believed like he didn't want to see companies making money out of us. And and you know people talked about the five in a row t shirts and the records and all that. Nothing to do with the team. It had nothing to do with the team. We didn't do any you know. Uh, we when we played in the in in eighty two, we had five all medals in our pocket. We weren't experienced, we weren't taken in by the Rasmataz, we weren't trying to capitalise money or whatever like that. But we did for a couple of years, 70, 79, 80, 81, uh, we were Mick to use our set. If, if anyone's going to make money out of us, it's going to be us. <laughs> and he was brilliant to that. He was absolutely brilliant. When, when we went up to, when we tried to raise the money for the five weeks to Australia, we went to North of Ireland. We went to Ulster for, for two weekends. 
and we played six matches Friday, Saturday, Sunday each year and Mick and five pounds into the each game it was a challenge game and for five pounds Sterling now that was Sterling was good those days but Mick wouldn't trust the boys to connect at the gate Mick hope he would bring two car loads from Kerry of fellas including Peter Keane's father the late Tom Keane to collect the money to get in case anyone had fucking take anyone so we we did that we went up oh we made a fortune we made a fortune up and on some five pounds at five pounds uh, we had four and five thousand at games Friday after Friday night games in the Borden or uh, Friday night game in, in Castle Blaney or something like that Jesus huge money out here it was great <laughs> <laughs> and um, Bomber was also going on about how how Competitive spirit that. Um, tell me this. How's Vernie doing? Would you tell me this? Okay, he, let's touch it. Michael, while you're while you're on a break there, how are you getting on? Yeah, not too bad, Shane. About three hundred and nearly four hundred done now at this stage, so we're going all right. Yeah, I got the update. Yeah, I got the update there. You had three hundred and ninety-one done, but of course I messed up the the countdown clock, so I'm not a hundred percent sure how long he has left to go. Um, Pat, so another thing I was going to ask you was uh, about your club, oh, Temple No, that uh, they had a, you know, a bit of a resurgence this year to win um, a Munster Intermediate Football Championship. Now, I think most people would have even fancied them to go on and win in All-Ireland. Oh, uh, don't talk about it. Yeah. Oh, uh, that's bad news. Yeah, Oopsrard. Oh, uh, uh, sad man. Left it behind, left it behind. But is it a case that they're, uh, is the club making a comeback? Not, no, I mean, look what we are. We're a very small club. In small clubs and small counties, it's cyclical. Every 40 years, every 50 years, every 60 years, suddenly a bunch comes together. Uh, in 10 years' time, where will Tip and All Club be? Probably down in June or novice, we'll be down around Division 4. But but we have a golden spell of five or six years at the moment. With a golden, we're the only country club, we're the only rural club that's in the Kerry Senior Championship this year. That is, that is so much. For a, for a, think about it. For a club with a population of 400, for a club, think about this, for a club, probably certainly the only senior club in Ireland that doesn't have a national school in this area. Amazing. And, and who'd be your favourite player to watch? Uh, this is uh, just a final question before I let you go. Who's your favourite player to watch at the moment? Ah, oh, Jesus, David Clifford. Ah, oh, David Clifford is just... I've watched David Clifford since he was under 12 playing against Tippano. I've watched this fella develop. Uh, look, any any man that can bring five, 4,000 extra supporters to a Kerry County final, which David Clifford did last year, that's the pulling power, that's the magnetism, that's the genius that is David Clifford. He's our Messi, he's our Ronaldo, he's our Pele. He is just a genius. And, 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 and you know what, on top of everything else, a brilliant role model and a really good guy. Really level-headed, really well-rounded individual. Comes from a great family. Uh, the sky is the limit for him if he remains injury-free. I, I, I watch him every morning, every day, every afternoon. Pat, you've been absolutely brilliant with your time. Really, no really do appreciate it. Best of luck to Michael. So thanks very much. I'm sure we'll talk to you again in the future, Pat. All the best. A pleasure, pleasure. Good luck. So that was Pat's plan. We're, we're now... 25 minutes into it now I did mess up Michael Verney in terms of the countdown clock and there it is I have it starting at, at 60 minutes again I don't think you'll be able for another 60 minutes of, of, of this how are you feeling at this point 442 done just going to update that on the screen yeah you're in the halfway there Shane four more sets and we'll be up halfway happy enough to be honest with you still in the do the 17 in a row so that's good Okay, we'll just watch as he gets going, and um, I'm going to prepare the next call. So uh, I'm just going to put Michael Verney on full screen here, and um, Michael, will you just get in your position for one? Just, just hold.
Just as uh, Michael continues to do the push-ups there, I'm going to pay, play a little clip from one of his, uh, his county men, Johnny Pilkington, talking about um, the time that there was a rumour that he had a packet of cigarettes in his, <laughs> in his socks. It wasn't the packet of cigarettes, it was the cigarette like. Um, so when we came in, at that time, you could smoke in or uh, you could smoke. Uh, so it came in at half time of the match, and the self and try would go to the jar and you'd have a cigarette in that. But, uh, so obviously, you take a cigarette and the cigarette lighter out of your pocket, into the shower, have it all right. So you've nowhere to put the cigarette lighter then, and you put down your sock. And so off you go anyway, and you go back in, and then there's a half going on. And just stand there. But when I came back in, then after a half time, I took off the sock and here the cigarette lighter fell out. But it wasn't the pack of cigarettes. You know, that's how stories are. A bit, of a, bit exactly. of a Chinese whisper there. I'm going to put up another clip now. Uh, this is Liam Hayes, who I spoke of earlier, who won All Ireland's with Mead back in the <coughs> 80s. This is him talking about the one time that uh, Sean Boylan lost the rag with him, as he explained. So uh, have a quick little look and listen to this. I would lose the rag with Sean pretty quickly, fairly easily. We were in uh, Dalgan Park one, one evening, training. Was some big match coming up, and, and the pressure was on everyone. Everyone was stressed out. It was absolutely lashing rain, and Sean started doing this drill. And... <laughs> I got talking to somebody and or somebody asked me a question and I replied and I turned around and I asked Sean, what did you say? And he got thick with me and uh, I got thick with him and he came over to me and threw the whistle at my feet and said, OK, you take the fucking session. And Sean never cursed and he turned on his feet and walked off the training field and left me there with the 30 other players looking an idiot. Lash and rain with the whistle at my feet. So I had to go running after Sean and say, listen, they'll come back, come back, come back. Um, Colin O'Rourke always said that if I wasn't as thick and as stupid as I am, I would have taken up the whistle and let Sean keep on walking. Just a little bit of a technical issue with uh, getting Eamon Dunphy on, so um, we might just have to wait another minute or two. In the meantime, here is uh, Tom Dempsey, 1996 goal scorer in the All-Ireland Final for Wexford, talking about uh, the legendary Tony Dorn. We were growing up 9, 10, 11 years of age, but we'd all go down to the local phone box and uh, we'd have a 2p coin, slip it in, we'd ring Tony, I was 89241 or 9241054, oh, and he'd come onto the phone maybe the night before, he'd play in an alert and find talk to you for an hour and a half, and you know, he maybe it was uh, maybe Tony got something out of it, Shane, maybe he got a bit of advice out of it, you know, it, it was a lovely thing, and if you think about it, in that type of environment, I can't imagine ringing, and this no disrespect to one of Davies players or Liam Sheedy's players now, the night before in All-Ireland, talking to him for an hour about the game the next day, you know, it just wouldn't happen. But they, they were so close to us, and it was such a really wonderful environment, and you would have been brought up in, a, in the same type of an environment in Barcelona. Like, it, you know, it's that type of an environment that does form, form your character, really, as you go a bit older. But we there could be 10 or 11 young lads waiting to get to have a quick chat with Tony, and uh, he'd put down the phone, and then God love the poor man at half nine, ten o'clock, because Wexford didn't travel 
the finals the night before they went up that morning and uh, actually had a great chat with him. You know, I, I often wonder did we drive the man mad or, <laughs> or whatever, but uh, it was something that we really look back on. But people people wouldn't realise the man's fame either that time. I, I remember as well, Shane, my mother used to watch the Buffers Alley jerseys that time. And, you know, they said Nicky Record was a very famous man, but Tony was so, they came from all over the country, but she was sitting in one evening and it was a kind of a darkish evening looking out. She looked out through the window and there was a car with five men in it, probably in their mid 40s, early 50s. And they were, they were tough looking men and they were looking in and they went up and down. And she thought, oh, my God, there's going to be some kind of a raid here or whatever. But she was about to go out and take down the jerseys, bring them in, the Buffers Alley jerseys. But the next minute the boys came out, came up to the door and said, Mrs, you wouldn't mind if we got to wear the 14 jersey, the Buffers Alley 40, out to the line. The boys, there was no cameras that time, Shane. So the boys put on the jersey took it off, handed it to the next fella, took it off, handed it to the next fella, said thanks very much and uh, headed off in the car. So I think what they probably said going home, that no matter what anybody would say, they wore the orange jersey. Yeah, Michael, how are you getting on? You under pressure? We're going all right, Shane. We're closing in on 600, I'd say. Um, yeah, the short... Shoulders are getting tired, all right, but uh, that comes, that's part and parcel of it. I haven't had to break down the 17 yet, which is good. I'm still able to do the 17 straight. In a couple of minutes, it'll probably be smaller segments, but going okay, thank God. Well, look, as we know, it's all for a good cause. And as I said, we, we had a bit of an issue getting um, getting Eamon Dunphy on, but we have, have found more than an adequate replacement, and that is... Um, goalkeeper Brendan Cummins well former goalkeeper Tipperary Brendan Cummins but goalkeeper coach maybe more so these days Brendan how are you doing? I'm sure I'm great now yeah does that mean I have to say something controversial about Michael Verney here now to let Twitter blow up or something like that if you could take the role. did he ever did he ever I don't know lay a dirty stroke on you in a match did he ever write anything uh, a little bit over the top about you? No he might have yeah he, he could have been one of these journalists who said the ball the flight of the ball deceived the goalie uh, those uh, nice lines to use uh, when you be reading of a Sunday having lift in a soft one when you saw that it meant goalie left in a blooper and that's the end of it like you know but it's <laughs> a bad and fair play to him for, for, for doing these press ups and all the cause is great and I'd be interested to see if he does actually make it to a thousand yeah oh do you see well he's pushing hard so far but just yourself Brendan at the moment the big conversation is uh if and when GEA does come back, would you like to see it behind closed doors or do you want to wait until everyone can go? I think it'll be a case of all or nothing, I think, on it. And behind closed doors, I'm not so sure. You, I see earlier on there on Sky, the, the Premier League, they're having the discussion, what happens if a player or, or one of the physios gets COVID-19 and then the whole panel is shut down. It's as simple as that. So I certainly can see 80,000 people in Crow Park in October, November. So I'm not too sure where the inter-county scene goes. Certainly at club level, I think there is a, a chinks of light, is probably the best <clears> way of putting it, that we that we might get something going at some stage later in the year because obviously the volume of crowds, but inter-county, unless a vaccine, I think, comes into play on this thing, which would be a huge game changer. I'm, I'm not so sure it'll play behind closed doors because the players are amateurs and if they get it, they have to go home, isolate, could meet a family member. And really, the, the you know, we don't want any night thing like, happen like that for our, our players and Sports really become secondary. We've seen that in the last month or six weeks, and uh, that's it. We just have to mind each other. So, how much has hurling changed since you made your debut? Was it back in nineteen ninety two or three that you made your debut with Tipperary? Like, just how yeah, much did it change? Yeah, it's changed. Uh, it's, look, it's, it's evolving constantly. I think every two or three years now the game is evolving. When I started, certainly my first championship game was in ninety five. First league game was in ninety three. It was a case of Brendan lashed the ball down the field as far as you can. Then the forwards started to give out a little bit. Declan Ryan was starting to give me rumblings in the dressing room. By the time we got to, we'll say, 98, 99, Nicky came on and then he, Nicky had me caught up saying, you need to do this better and that better and puck outs need to be better. So it was constantly trying to get better and better. So yeah, so every year it's a bit like a computer now. If you stand still, you're obsolete and that's the, the holy all of it. And certainly we've seen in the last number of years, Limerick, we thought when we see Kilkenny and Tipperary's trilogies that I played in, then Tipperary, Kilkenny, 16, you know, then you say Watford had evolved the game against the sweeper and Limerick then had taken what Kilkenny and Tip did, plus what Watford did, plus a higher skill level and implemented that, you know. So, I mean, it's all, it's just constantly, it has to be and that's the way it is. 
Mm. And uh, just to, to quickly remind everyone that this is all for a good cause and you can donate on, on Michael's uh, GoFundMe page, which is, of course, in the in the description of this video. It's for Do It For Dan. It's also for, um, for PPE for the HSE workers. So very, very good causes. Brendan, just who would be the have been the biggest influence on your career, um, underage when you came on the tip scene, whatever it might be. I suppose underage, I'm no different than any other any other players. My dad would have brought me down to the field, but I think once I got to inter county level, what lit me up the most personally was Nicky English. Um, he found something inside me. He motivated me. He challenged me the way I felt that I needed to be challenged. He, um, he helped me set goals. All that kind of stuff in 99 my game really went to another level and then i suppose you know after the, the whole babs in in 2007 then eamon o'shea arrived on the scene and i think the biggest thing eamon o'shea gave me was puck outs and i had to change my swing i had to change the way i looked at the game and not only some managements can would come in and tell you you need to change this you need to change that but eamon actually showed me how to change and then he gave me homework for all the world and what we needed to do. I went and did it and knew that if I could do it properly, like he said, the team would change. So I knew where I fit in the in the setup as well, hitting out the ball. So between the flight of the ball, the rhythm of the swing, all that kind of stuff, and Paddy will tell you all about it. He's a drug, that man. And you know, I had a serious high under him and O'Shea to say the least, and it was it was fantastic because like I say, you can teach an old dog new tricks. Mm. And uh, just just for the viewers out there expecting Eamon Dunphy on at the moment, we had a bit of an issue. Like we're we're expect he doesn't actually have a mobile phone, so we're uh, waiting for his other half to get back to us and uh, set up the Zoom link. But uh, as of as of yet, it just hasn't quite happened. So hopefully we will get that sorted soon enough. Brendan, one time um, I remember interviewing you at Croke Park. It was uh, um, at some gig or other. And the thing you mentioned to me was how you were motivated by Liam Sheedy. I think it was probably 2010. And then when you came out of the dressing room, there was sort of newspaper clippings everywhere showing you what people thought of you. Can you do you do you remember that um, that particular eventuality? Yeah, I think every like even back in '99, we would have had music going in on the bus and all. But that was a big part of of Liam. And I know from hearing from other players in the county panels, it is a huge part of motivating yourself and getting you psychologically set in a siege mentality, I suppose, to do things that appear like they're superhuman. So if I'm down in Crow Park with 80,000 people around me and I start to realize like, oh my God, if I make a mistake, but if you're motivated by I'm against the world, nobody else thinks I can win this match, only me and the 14 fellas in front of me and the other 26 or seven fellas that are on the bench in the backroom team, then certainly that's it. And I think reminders like that are all over the dressing rooms. You can take it as honesty, trust, leadership, all those words are on every dressing room or you can put newspaper cuttings on the ground. Like, I think we had that in 09 before we played Kilkenny. They were on the ground, as you went out in Turles, because Kilkenny had absolutely hammered us, you remember, in the league uh, just before half time. I'll never forget it, Martin Cohen for Chipney. And uh, that was their fifth goal in the first half. And, you know, the shout was lock the doors and make them watch it. And Kilkenny supporters, in fairness, they were in their absolute pomp at that stage, Kilkenny eating teams. So, like, we come from that position to 09, then later in the year, getting them in a the league final. So, it absolutely makes sense to remind your players of that dark place and say we're not going there again and I think it fueled the performance in us um, and you know and then I suppose eventually a team develops and evolves which we probably did in 10 and 11 into being what's called the self starters you don't need to be throwing all that kind of stuff at them they know themselves but when they're trying to find their way like we were in 09 it was it was the right thing to do. Did, did you ever doubt yourself at any stage during your career? You know, you'd won All Stars, and I think you're even on the, been picked on that Sunday game team team of the Sunday game era there at the moment. I'm not sure if you're actually involved in picking the team, but well, I wouldn't have when I'm picking it like. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's public vote! It's public vote! <laughs> yeah, it seems to be causing consternation too. But did you ever doubt yourself throughout your career? I mean, of course, there was that famous situation in 07 when you were left on the bench for Jerry Kendi, and then the team ends up getting knocked out against Wexford, and I'm not putting that down to Jerry Kendi but did you actually doubt yourself at all during that no I never doubted myself off the pitch we'll say in training and all that in preparation but there was times like there's there's two games in particular stick out in my head where I definitely had the wobbles like it was the 2001 all Ireland semi final against Wexford when things have been going really well for me in 2000 into 2001 I was flying it, it looked like oh, you can't get a goal on that felt like everything was going great you know and then Something got inside my head in that All Ireland semi final, and I could not wait for the final whistle to blow. I remember asking the umpire with about 10, 12 minutes left, 
you know, and how long's left? He said about 12 minutes. I think we were five or six points up. I remember him saying to me, look, you're probably out the gap here. And I thought, I'll get away with this one. Next thing, Larry Gorman flashed one in over my right shoulder. I don't know, it was Mitch Jordan got one into the corner, flew under my legs. And I asked the umpire how long's left. He said, there's only a minute, he said, and we were a pint up. You better hope he blows it up. <laughs> because, man, to be honest, I was punch drunk. It was just something that happens. And the next time it happened, we actually was in 2011. All Ireland final, and uh, I had a serious dose of the, the hips that day. Really, I was able to ask it to a certain extent, but inside my head, I, I definitely didn't enjoy what was going on that day. And um, there are moments, and maybe that day was one where you say to yourself, "Look, if I can get out of here, I take it." Like you know, and, and that's a dark place your mind goes. And how much experience you have, every player encounters at goalies, especially because it's a lonely enough spot. But I remember that day, Mick Fenley actually took a shot on me about 20 yards I remember thinking when he hit it this is my Ken Hogan moment like when the ball flies in and everyone kind of says oh my god look what's the afternoon kind of thing and somehow some way I controlled the ball went out to the side and cleared it and to this day to be honest with you I'm not too sure how but I'm glad it didn't go in yeah and of course you had some fantastic days won your all-stars won your all-irelands can I ask you about the guys that you would have faced over the years and by that I mean the attackers bearing down on goals Is there, were there any particular guys where you thought when he got the ball oh no I'm just going to be turning around and picking up the ball here. Well, it's a few, I suppose, as the, as the modern, as the game developed. DJ Kerr was certainly one anyway. Uh, when he hit it, it stayed hit. Like Paul Flynn, even up to underage, like he's a year or two older than me, Flynn was the one, like he was lethal. Like if Flynn's taken 65, you're wondering if he's going to go for a goal. Uh, he had nothing else in his mind when he hit in the back of the net. And it was, you know, a bit like Eugene Clunan was the same way in Galway. You know, they had this ability to roll their wrists over the ball and it would start probably two feet over the crossbar and end up going in just above head high. So, I mean, they were the ones. I mean, the modern era then, of course, you have Eddie Brennan, um, Richie Power, and he got in his hand, you're going for the fucking out hurley as well. But Joe Canning then from a dead ball is the other one. I mean, when Joe again hits it like... And these fellas pride themselves on getting goals. You know before the match that they're thinking as part of their goals, I need to get one or two goals here and a point is good enough for me. You know, so they would be the, the ones through history that have faced that you'd be going to yourself when they get it, I'd be on my guard here. Well, look, Brendan, you've been brilliant with your time. Maybe you want to give a final word to Michael Burney there as he starts his latest set. Yeah, it's a joke. And the best of luck, Michael. You're doing for a fantastic cause. Couldn't be for an awfully fella to back down from any kind of a challenge anyway. So uh, I'm sure you'll have muscles on your arms on you like Popeye by the time you're finished. But well done, by I've done donation made anyway so we're we're all set for the Cummins household so well done to all of you fair play cheers thanks very much Brendan Michael uh... no matter good up guys well done Michael how are you getting on there three quarters of the way there Shane I've broken it down into nines and eights but uh, doing okay now doing okay another ten seconds rest and we go again I think uh, Eamon Dunphy has been trying to get through but uh, I'm actually uh I think he's been trying to ring your phone there, Michael, so <laughs> unfortunately he might have the, the wrong one. So uh, I'm just going to leave you with Michael just for a couple of moments and see if I can um, see what we can do and hopefully set something up. We were up. growing up 9, so, uh, 10, 11 years of age, but we'd all get down to the there. local There's phone box. Coming up again. And actually, uh, what better thing to keep you going for a couple of minutes than Joe Dooley singing the Joe Dooley song? How are you, lads? Joe Dooley here, reporting from Ryan's Mountain in Kennedy, up for a good walk with the dog Buddy. Um, this coronavirus, lads, is getting serious, and I just said I'd share a little idea with you. Um, when you're washing your hands, which I'm sure you're all doing regularly, it's very important that you wash them for a long enough period. And some people are suggesting to sing a little song called Happy Birthday to me, or to you. But I have a better idea, and I find it works very, very well. And what you should do is sing a verse of the Joe Dooley song, which goes something like this. When the ball's in the sky in Crow Park in July, that's Joe Dooley. When the ball's in the air, who's that man in the square? That's Joe Dooley. What a boy, pride and joy of Uvali. He's in gold, white and green from the fields of Clarine. That's Joe Dooley. Now, lads, what you'll find, you'll get very, very good results if you sing that and put your heart and soul into it as well. Don't just half sing it. And I would suggest that, um, Kieran, you have been shaking hands, yes. selling second hand and new cars there for the last couple of weeks. Maybe you should sing two verses of it. And Ollie, 
I'd suggest maybe for a couple of weeks that you might actually sing the whole song. The Billy Dooley verse, the Johnny Dooley verse and the whole lot. And um, I hope you're all keeping well. And that's me over and out now for now. Bye bye from Rhines Mountain in Kennedy. Thanks for watching our game. Don't forget to like and share the videos. And if you're new to the channel, hit subscribe. No, you're okay, actually. Man. Can I get your phone for don't be? I can. Yeah, can I get your phone for don't be? Oh, sure. Oh, joy. Huh? Oh, joy. You said, can I? Get okay, we're back in. Um, so we couldn't quite um, set up exactly as we wanted to. Uh, Davy Fitz wasn't available, but I think in a, in, in a way we got the next best thing, and uh, that is to bring in Aidan Tierney. Aidan, how are you doing? Uh, how, what would Davy make of this situation? <laughs> Can you hear me there, Aidan? Oh, we seem to be having a small little issue with that, so we'll just go back to, uh, to Michael for a moment. Michael, uh, when you when you're finished that set, you might tell us how you're getting on because you're after passing the uh, I think you're after passing the 800 mark. You're on 816 now, and I'm sure that your uh, your arms are absolutely screaming at you by this stage. Yeah, we're having a bit of a problem. We're on the end of the sun, so we're up over 800, 830 something, 833. So I need every second now to get ready. Okay, so just bear with me for another second. I'll put Michael on full screen there and uh, play another little video. This is uh, Tony Scullion, who of course was full back in the Derry 1993 team talking about bringing the cup home, a great little clip. And uh, the full interview is on ourgame.ie. I say he never seen me playing live in his life because he got barred. He got barred with arthritis um, when we were young, and um, and he wasn't. He was in crutches, so he wasn't able to go to the matches. And Mammy seen me play just once in a club match. Never seen me play live. But in the other, going back to the Ireland final '93, yes, there was the matches on TV at that stage. And the Ireland final '93, I think that's what you're yeah. talking about there. Uh, this is true, 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 true story. Mammy sat in the wee room on the TV where the TV was at and watched the learning final. Daddy could not watch it. He was a wild man. He was from the Rosary Beach and he prayed a lot. And uh, thanks to me, he must have said good prayers for us. Because, and then he'd, he'd have went, he went to the bedroom that day. He could not watch that game. He went to the bedroom. So Mammy reported back and forth from the kitchen to the bedroom how the game was going. And he kept praying. And... Uh, 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 I know, and, it's, uh, and I've said this before, and I mean this from the bottom of my heart. Uh, my firstborn, my first girl, Charlene, was born two weeks before the Ireland final, the 5th of September, 93. And she was christened the week after it in the Holy Rosie, Rosie Chapel in Ballinus Green. And uh, late Leo, fa Father Leo Derry, who was a great J man, who was parish priest in the parish, christened Charlene. And I had Sam Maguire cup for that christening. And I think Father Day threw more holy water in the Sam Maguire than he did in the fountain. And, and, uh, and, but I got, as I say, I got the cup that day, the week after. And I think my, my proudest moment was taking the cup down 22 Karen Money Lane and putting the cup on Daddy's knee. If you'd have seen the smile on Daddy's face that day, little did he know that Derry would ever won the All Ireland back in the 70s. He never thought he would see it. But little did they know he had one of his sons playing for Derry. Right, so uh, 
we're having a little bit of trouble with uh, getting Davy Fitz on, a bit of a technical issue. But the next best thing, you you actually look like you have a fine little colour down there, possibly from touring around Cora Clare. Look, I ain't gonna say, you know, Sean, uh, I was out in the bog there today. I, I 100% certain there was no way I was down in Cora Clare Beach or down in Wexford with the bike, you know, I was over in the bog down the stone there, and I saw it up. That's all I'm gonna say. <laughs> um, and what do you think Pat's plan would make of this? Because we, we had him on a little earlier, but um, yeah, I don't know, we might get a few more words from him. Well, look at Shane, do you know something you got me thinking of there? Look at, I remember Michael Vanney when he played back a number of years ago. Look at, do you want to get out there about him? He was a serious, serious operator. And look at, if he's half as good at doing the push ups as he's at doing the journalism to play the GE to hold out to it, I tell you one thing, the future for Offaly is bright. What, what do you think uh, Brian Cody would make of this situation? Oh, yeah, I suppose, uh, you know, I suppose, you know, I suppose very much from a Kenny point of view, I suppose, uh, you know, push-ups are very much like the game of hurting and that uh, every press-up uh, takes on a life of its own. And, um, I'm not sure, listen, I suppose, from head on, uh, I suppose, probably the, probably the greatest achievement for Offaly down the last number of years, that Michael can do the thousands. And, um, the way they're going at the moment, I'm sure they'll, they'll probably latch on to absolutely anything. <laughs> what would Don Logue make of it? Uh, yeah, look, what I'm going to say I need to buy it upside down here. Look, for me, I think the GA is now facing a real crisis at the moment because we have all these guys out there, they are doing the push-ups, they are doing the fight challenges, and nobody talking about it. This is the game of hurling. And like, for me, I think we need to get the GPA back on board here take over, you know, because oh, we're not careful because I, I just think it's so sad. I see nobody out there with a hole or a ball or a slitter or nothing. All I see is 5k push-ups. All I see is making cakes during the lockdown. I see guys doing all these Zoom dances and all these, I, I mean, <laughs> you're, you're cracking the man up. Vernie, you're under pressure there, are you? Oh, mate, stop. How are you supposed to do push ups when you're listening to that? And you've 900 of them done. We're not doing too bad. Uh, what, would, what would O'Rourke make of this? Well, look, I suppose the one thing that I would always have said about Offaly down the last number of years. It was right back to the time of Seamus Darby and the likes of Matt Connor and all these players. Offaly always produced wonderful Gaelic footballers and terrific hurlers. The only problem was they only came around about once every 40 years. So all I'd say is I think that Michael is probably exceeding all expectations at the moment. And I think the one other thing I'd like to say is that if he does complete the thousand, then I see there's no reason why he shouldn't have, you know, be presented in front of Crow Park on All Ireland final day. And I suppose the only problem with that would be there would be about 55 people there. <laughs> what would be all over a heart to make of it? Well, no, I was on the RT News last week on Shocked and Sakatcha. That was last week. <laughs> And Michael is a great awfully man. He's going to do a thousand push ups, or you could say press But if you looked at the footage that evening on the news, I would do that every evening after I do a 19 kilometre walk around the back garden. Maybe lift a few dumbbells, maybe five or six hundred chin ups and pull ups or a classical exercise. Almost 19 years of age. So I'd be a little bit disappointed that Michael is only going for a thousand. I thought he might go for three or four thousand or maybe five thousand. <laughs> what about Joe Brawley? You're, you're, you're interrupting his flow here, but uh, at the same time, what would Joe, Joe Brawley, definitely a Joe Brawley uh, chat isn't going to slow him down. Well, I mean, of course, I mean, the Gaelic Games is now facing a total an utter crisis. I mean, it's a total liberation of the great Gales through the years. I mean, I remember the great dairy team of my era. I mean, which is utterly privileged to be in. I mean, they're ferocious warriors, an incredible, fierce competitor. I mean this sincerely. I have absolutely no idea what I'm going to say. 
<laughs> Look, Aidan Tierney uh, of Tierney Talks, really, really appreciate you coming on there. That was brilliant stuff. No bother at all. Best to look, guys. Thank you. Michael Ver Michael, Ver uh, Michael Verney, you must be under pressure at this stage. Four, four, four rounds. Four rounds of 17 left. Three. Three and a half. I'm going to see now if I can. I'll make one last push to see if I can get uh, Eamon Dunphy on here. So bear with me and I'll just put uh, Michael up full screen. I say he never seen me playing live in his life because he got barred, he got barred with last riders, um when we were young. And, um, and while I do, and here's he James McCartan talking about 1991. So Joe didn't have a great start of the season, but still won the All match. Ireland. Never seen me play like. Yeah, I, <laughs> I don't know. I, I remember going down to play uh, uh, two rounds three against Kildare uh, a few weeks before the start of the championship, and we couldn't get 15 players. And we had a we get two men on the Sunday morning and gathered up. Uh, up the, and they weren't regulars for their club, so we gathered up a team and we we, we went down and we played Kildare. <laughs> Look, we weren't in a great place. There's no point in saying any different. But it's, momentum is a wonderful thing, and uh, we fell over the line against uh, Armagh and Mary. Terrible game by all accounts. But then things started to gather momentum. Uh, a game against Derry, they needed a replay to get over them. A massive kick by Ross Char to keep us in, in the game and, and to get a replay for us. We probably played a wee bit of a. Uh, Strange one in that the game was supposed to replay was supposed to be seven days later, and uh, Greg Bill had been sent off. So that would have meant Greg would have been suspended because he automatically got the back off, then. Yeah. We quickly got Greg brought back into the camp, and they had a game the following week. So that the, the football game had to be raced. Two left. We will be having Eamon Dunphy coming on in a minute. It's going to be via phone rather than uh, than by Zoom, but we're going to have him nonetheless, so that's that's brilliant. 986 push-ups, Michael. You're right there, right at the edge. Let's, uh, fair play to you, and I think anyone watching, this is an incredible performance and uh, absolutely worthy of donating on his behalf because this, is, this has been brilliant stuff, and I'm getting tired looking at you. Michael, what number are you at now? It's 996. Four push-ups left, Shane. You're some man, to be fair to you. Four push-ups left, I do, and uh, you're you're doing it inside. Are you doing it inside the um, the allotted time? Yeah, about a minute inside. Hey, we'll spice it up a little. <laughs> <laughs> <Hey, laughs> the arrogance of the man, huh? Woo! <laughs> 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 Well done, Michael Verdi. Congrats. Absolutely brilliant stuff. I think anyone who's watching in there should absolutely donate on his behalf. Go to the GoFundMe page. It's, it's uh, attached to the video there. Michael, come closer to the camera and tell us how you're feeling. Yeah, pretty uh, tired, Shane. I tried to do a couple of clap push-ups there <laughs> and my shoulders gave out. But, um, ah, cheers. No, brilliant. Uh, just to be honest with you, all the support and all the donations and all the promoting on social media, all that means so much. Um, Two, two vital causes. Um, it's just great over the last week that we're going to be able to send Dan Donner over to America to get that operation that he needs, a life-changing operation. And just to all the frontline staff doing absolutely Trojan work, putting their health at risk for our health and everybody else's health and our relatives' health. Um, any bit of money and PPE that I can provide to them through this, um, sure it's, it's brilliant. It's brilliant for them. Um, just encourage everyone just to give it one last, literally one last push and just see see how far we can go. The, the goal is 12, but there's no reason why we can't go to 15 or 16. And uh, just thanks so much to everybody for all their support. It's been immense. And how are your arms feeling? Uh, <laughs> not, not great. Not great. Um, uh, Aidan Tierney's me, Oliver Arctic Tierney, got me there when he said about doing 3,000 push-ups. But um, yeah, no, they're not, they're not great. It's funny, you think you could stay going, but they're just, they're gone. They're gone now. They're just, they're goosed. But, um, well, well, now we have uh, we have Eamon Dunphy here. Um, not quite um, over Zoom, but we have him on on the phone here. Eamon, how are you doing? I'm fine, Shane. I'm sorry about the technical difficulties, but they're very common these days. <laughs> not at all. I was more worried that people would think I was spoofing and that I never had you on at all in the first place. 
I know, I, I'm delighted to be on, um, and there's no problem. Has he done that thousand press-ups yet? He just finished the thousand press-ups in the space of an hour and did it just inside the time. It's fairly good going and all for charity. Yeah, no, it is good going, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm glad you didn't have space to do it. <laughs> <laughs> and Eamon, how are you getting on recently? Uh, all well with you? Yeah, everything is good. Um, I'm working, we can do our podcast for the stand from the house here where I have a studio. And I... Um, being on cocooned, um, go for a little walk every day, but only just around the block. Hmm. And uh, thank God, at the moment, everyone is okay. And I'm sure you're keeping on top of everything in the football world. Yeah. Um, you see today that the UK are talking about maybe teams that could go back if if all the players and staff got three tests each per week, which would amount to thirty thousand pounds per week. And obviously, these massively wealthy clubs would be able to do that. Would you would you be happy with League of Ireland teams if it was possible a couple of the top managers were talking about at least seeing the feasibility of it and maybe Republic of Ireland qualifier matches? Would, would you be okay with it going behind behind closed doors? Uh, I, yes, I'd be okay with it going behind closed doors, Shane, but I don't think that's the only issue. Football is a contact sport um, and therefore um, there's no way um, if someone on the pitch had it had the virus that you could be guaranteed they wouldn't spread the virus and that's a problem so the only way I could see it happening um, and the, with the Premier League is about seven or 800 million at stake in TV money the only way it can happen in my view is if they go into isolation for two weeks before they start then play the games and go back to isolation Every team would have to do that, um, so you would be pretty certain that they didn't have the virus. Mm. Um, and I don't know, really, it's a judgment call, it's a difficult call to make. Everyone would love to see football back, but um, in Spain, for example, and in France, for sure, they said no more football this year. It's a contact sport, um, and it, you have to be. Um, you know, cognizant of all the other factors. For example, the example it shows to other people um, about how they behave. I know people, football lovers would love to see it. They wouldn't mind seeing it behind closed doors. But there's a lot of factors to be taken into consideration. Um, and I think uh, you'd have to be uh, 95% plus confident that it wasn't a dangerous environment. Mm. And and in terms of the Premier League, Liverpool fans want this uh, long wait over. How do you how would you like to see the Premier League finished at the moment if things can't come back in, in the coming weeks or months? I don't think you can finish it, Shane. Mm. It will have to finish as it is. Um, would you award them the title and then whoever's in no, the relegation? I think, well, I think the relegated clubs have a case in law, I would think. The people, the clubs that are in the relegation positions that they haven't had the opportunity to play their way out of, of those relegation positions. So I don't think you could have a winner or I don't think you could have relegation. I think you just have to wait the season out uh, and it counts for nothing mm. because there's so much at stake. If for the relegated clubs, it's 150 million they'd lose if they drop into the championship. Uh, and I don't think they'd do that without going to law and arguing that they hadn't had the chance uh, to save themselves. So mm. that's very, very tricky indeed. Mm. I think if you, a dealer issue is Champions League places. Um, top four clubs qualify for next season's Champions League. How do you uh, work that out, for example? So it's very, very tricky. There'll have to be um, some creative thinking. It will have to be agreed by UEFA and the Premier League clubs, um, and that's a matter for uh, discussion, I'm sure, and negotiation. Uh, you're obviously a, f a famous football man, but I, I was always curious, Do you ha what sort of a GA background would you have had or exposure to when you were a young man, or did oh, you at very, all? Very big, we were, mm. our house was a GA house. Mm. Um, my father, um, and indeed my mother was a Limerick woman, she was big into the Limerick hurling team, and the Mackey brothers in the past, uh, back in the day, uh, and my dad was 
first generation Dublin, but essentially Kilkenny background. So we were hurling was a big thing, and we followed Vincent's uh, in football and hurling. They were very good at both. Uh, but superb at football and we followed the Dublin hurlers uh, the Dublin footballers and the Kilkenny hurlers right um, and we followed them religiously I was in Croke Park every Sunday oh brilliant and, and would you have played much yourself? no I didn't have the opportunity because um, there wasn't the GA club the nearest GA club to us was actually Vincent's and I was uh, way too small I think to play Kelly football uh, I got a hurl once from my grandfather when I was 8 for my birthday and I broke it the next day <laughs> so that was the end of that but the clash of the ash uh, and it was over but um, I was a great follower we were great followers and my brother Kevin my late brother and my father uh, and myself would go and my grandfather to Croke Park every Sunday in the summer well look Damon you've been very good for coming on um, appreciate oh, it was a great pleasure yeah appreciate that and all the best and hopefully we'll chat again soon thank you very much Shane so Michael, that was that was Eamon Dunphy. Brilliant to uh, to get him on just to to help us out with this fundraiser here. Because of course we did say we were we were going to chat to him, and I'm delighted to say that we could uh, pull through with that. But just before we uh, finish up, how are you feeling now? Is there a bit of elation? Yeah, just a bit disappointed with Eamon. I thought he was going to say, you know, they were good push-ups, but they weren't great push-ups. That's not a bad uh, impersonation. <laughs> it's uh, it was great to have him online there. Um, Eamon is a mysterious one in that he has no mobile phone, so it's been very, very difficult to get, get in contact with him, but he promised me he'd come on, and delight, delighted to have him. He's one of the biggest sporting personalities in Ireland. It's great to have him. Um, the shoulders don't feel too bad now. It's kind of a, it's a sudden rush. It was absolutely jammed at the end of it now, to be honest with you, but not too bad now. It's the show, push-ups are just one of those things, as Falan was saying, he couldn't do them. I was always I wasn't too bad at them, um, so I said that was the only realistic challenge that I could try and meet. But uh, oh, it was just great. Uh, I haven't got a chance to check the GoFundMe yet, but hopefully there's money still streaming in there um, for a great cause. Again, I just asked everyone just to make one final push, and uh, thanks to everyone for tuning in. It's been great. And Shane, without being smart, thanks a million to you for putting this together. Um, couldn't have, couldn't have done it without, without you. Um, I know people are starved of live sport at the moment. Um, I kind of, I kind of uh, build it to people as watching human torture, and that's kind of what it was like there near the end. But thanks a million to yourself for putting it together. Um, massive funds raised. We've been doing an awful lot of work behind the scenes over the past couple of weeks to put it together, and hats off to you. It was a top class production. Uh, well, just just to update you on uh, on the funds, you're at twelve thousand eight hundred and eighty, which is absolutely brilliant, and delighted for everyone who contributed to that. Because um, you know there was a lot that went into this. Michael put in a lot, thousand push-ups. He's done all the preparation, and thank you so much to all our guests who came on here. And if you're only watching this on a replay later on, and you st still feel like you could donate, we'd absolutely 100% appreciate that. So thanks very much, Michael, and uh, just I'll leave the final word to you, or maybe a little uh, a little gun flex. Just the, the last word, there were some people on to me wondering that if they donated and they didn't do the thousand push-ups, would they get their money back? So I'd, uh, I'd ask some of those people to double down maybe and put in another little donation now that they are done. But uh, thanks a million to everyone for doing it. And uh, yeah, I'm going to go and give these bad boys a little rest.